Today we define the state line. What was in Mississippi? What was in Tennessee? Where did Buford Pester's jurisdiction lie? Join me and my guest, Dennis Hathcock, as we explain all this. Hi, I'm Mike Elam, and this is Buford Pusser, The Other Story. Welcome to episode 18 of Buford Pusser, The Other Story. Uh, this episode is a follow-up to the uh, last one we did regarding the uh, death of Louise Hathcock at the uh, Shamrock Motel. Now, I tell about all of this in my book, Buford Pusser, The Other Story, that's available on Amazon. Uh, with me today is uh, Louise Hathcock's nephew, Dennis Hathcock. How are you, Dennis? I'm fine. How are you, Mike? I'm doing well. Wanted to talk to you a bit about the uh, state line and the fact of uh, how it was set up and how divided it was, because a lot of people don't understand that, uh, for instance, the Plantation Club and the uh, Shamrock Restaurant were on the Mississippi side of the border, while the motel and the White Iris sat on the uh, north side of the border in Tennessee. And your dad had the uh, plantation club, which was shown in the movie uh, Walking Tall as uh, being called the lucky spot. Right. Uh, now, I understand that uh, several months before Buford was even elected sheriff, that your dad had closed the plantation club down. Right. The plantation was closed when he was elected sheriff. So everything we saw in the movie about uh, the lucky spot uh, being open while Buford was sheriff is totally bogus. Fiction. Total fiction. Okay. Uh, now, that leaves us with the Shamrock Restaurant being on uh, the Mississippi side of the border whenever uh, Buford was sheriff. Now... Isn't that the place where uh, most of the alleged crimes at the state line took place? Uh, yes, yes. Can you go into what some of those things were? Uh, well, you know, it was a nice restaurant, and it drew a lot of, uh, it, you know, people traveling down the highway. At that time, 45 was the major highway from chicago down to the coast uh so they had a guy there that uh had what they called a razzle game and uh it was a numbers it was just a numbers game and uh they out counted people is what the what it was you right. rolled uh, uh some dice out of a cup they added it up and, uh, You've probably, most people have seen it if they've been to a fair or a carnival. It's a game that... Yeah, it's a very common sight at carnivals. Right, right. County fairs such as that. What about the uh, uh, sales of alcohol there? What can you tell us about that? Well, you know, they 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 did sell bonded whiskey, uh, sold beer, uh, 
Where did the uh, where did the bonded whiskey come from? Well, uh, some of it came from Missouri. So uh, that would have been the part that was illegal because it was bootlegged in. That's right. It, it had a, in other words, the Missouri, uh, Missouri tax was paid on it. It had a Missouri stamp on it, which, you know, that was illegal. But. Um, so Mississippi that, collected no tax on the alcohol that's sales, right. that's which right. was the problem. That's Right. Uh, and 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 you know there was some Mississippi whiskey sold there. Yeah, that had you know there was some sold there. Right. It, it just depended. They had such crazy alcohol laws back then. Is what that was a big problem. Yeah. Whiskey was legal, beer wasn't, and oh. you know they had it where beer was legal and whiskey was, you know, so. Kind of flip back and forth. Back and forth. Well, tell me Very something. Confusing. The movie made a big deal out of moonshine. Uh, what about the shamrock and the sale of moonshine? As far as I know, there was never a drop of moonshine whiskey sold at shamrock. They had better sense. But... Well, it was against a federal law as opposed to a state law. Uh, you broke a federal law then. You know, the only thing happened on the selling bonded whiskey was uh, you paid a fine for selling untaxed whiskey or state untaxed whiskey. Right. So the white whiskey was federal tax that wasn't paid on it. You know. And, uh, for you know, for instance, uh, and something we'll get into, and we've already touched on in a previous episode, was that was the reason that Toehead White went to prison was uh, he was moonshining and you know there was no right. taxes to be paid to the federal government and they were going to get their share. Right. That's exactly <laughs> right. All right. So you had the razzle game and the, you had the uh, sale of some illegal alcohol. So uh, it wasn't anything like the movie showed as far Not as uh, no gambling halls in the back room or anything like that. No, I'm not to, you know, I'm I'm not going to tell you or try to tell the people that they didn't sometimes have a card game over in the corner like goes on everywhere in America at yeah. times. I'm not trying to tell you that they may have shot some dice over in the corner. But no, it wasn't like going to Las Vegas or, or Tunica like they wanted to make it appear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Well, then let's go aside uh, across the uh, state line, which separated the motel and the restaurant by just a few feet. And uh, Buford had uh, jurisdiction over what transpired at the motel. Right. Because it was in Tennessee and in McNary County. Uh, so I guess what we need to define here for viewers that aren't familiar with this is that whatever went on in Mississippi, Buford had no control over. But None. The movies kind of made it appear that he did. No. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's uh, just a confusing thing for some people that we wanted to try and straighten out. Uh, now, I understand that bootleg whiskey uh, was sold out of the back room at the motel. Right, right, of, right, right, right there behind the office. Right, and because the motel was in over in the Tennessee McNary County site, at at that time whiskey was not legal. You couldn't sell whiskey. They didn't have liquor stores. When Pusser got elected sheriff, just about that time, beer was legal, but not whiskey. So they bootlegged whiskey out of the tepid head back there in the back and yeah sometimes hired carol he'd meet the customers when they'd pull up and uh he'd keep his pockets full of 
of half pints of uh, whiskey and uh, collect the money as the customer pulled up. And so, so that was 90, that was 90% of the business was half pints. Oh, I was about to ask you about that. You know, so uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of fifths or anything like that went out. Okay. Uh, well, how many times do you recall, you know, because Buford is credited with having cleaned up the state line. How many times can you think of, how many times do you know of that Buford actually arrested Louise? Oh, uh, well, truthfully, I can't remember, but I can't remember, but one time. Now, I know he uh, arrested her in December of 1964 during multi-jurisdictional raid there that where you had uh, people from the state of Tennessee, people from uh, Alcorn County, and also uh, the state of Mississippi that all converged and uh, they found Louise's car had liquor in it. Right. And uh, I mean, oh, that, in that case... He had to arrest her because all these other agencies were there. Uh, he, he had to look good, you know, and I think that's the reason why on your website you've got it posted, uh, uh, some newspaper headlines or something, or they got to where they cut him out of any raids or yeah. anything they did because yeah. they figured out what he was doing, you know, that he was being paid, you yeah, know. On, on my Facebook page, I do have some uh, newspaper clippings there where, uh, you know, it's telling how that uh, the state alcohol beverage uh, control agents there uh, excluded Buford from raids in his own county because uh they knew the word would get out that uh, these different clubs were about to be raided. And, uh, you know, a lot of the people that I interviewed that operated those clubs, uh, you know, would openly admit, yeah, I paid Buford. And uh, part of the deal was I'd know if we were going to get raided. So, uh, but, you know, that's uh, just something that just totally contradicts the uh, legend that we learned in Walking Tall. Uh at any rate, we're going to take a short break, and uh, we'll be right back. All right, I'd like for anyone that uh, wishes to subscribe, like, share, or comment on the videos, uh, because that helps us keep bringing these episodes to you and explaining the real story of Buford Pusser. So, uh, Dennis, uh, there were claims that people who stayed at the motel that was in the, on the Tennessee side were often drugged, robbed there at the Shamrock. And, uh, I was wondering what you can tell me about that because I only know of one case which, uh, involved, uh, George and Dorothy Vogel. Well, I mean, I guess you can tell them about George and Dorothy Vogel, but I can tell you what I know practically for a fact. I don't know of anybody that was robbed or drugged that was done by Louise or Jack or anybody. I'm not saying that possibly some people that was over at the restaurant or over at the club when it was running, when it was going wide open, didn't have a room over there and took some woman that they picked up over there, over there, and they didn't rob or give or or do something. I'm not saying that didn't happen. But as far as Jack and Louise, uh, 
you know, they get credit for a lot of things they didn't do. I'll just put it that way. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the case with George and Dorothy Vogel uh, allegedly being drugged and robbed, that is the only documented case that I'm aware of, and I've researched this story from one end to the other. Uh, I don't know. She uh, claimed that uh, they thought they were drugged at the uh, restaurant. They had stopped there to stay at the motel because of a uh, ice and snowstorm as they were returning from the uh, Gulf Coast to uh, Benson, Illinois, where they lived. And uh, that while they were in the restaurant, that they were drugged when they went to the room, went to bed, went to sleep. Somebody came into the room and stole her purse was her claim. Uh, however, you know, when I was interviewing, uh, Barbara Anderson Mitchell, uh, she was telling me how her brother, Bobby, uh, you know, which was of course, Jack and Louise's nephew, uh, found the purse in the restaurant that it wasn't right. stolen, that most likely that, uh, Dorothy had left it there. Well, it, where they found it. Like the booth was up against the outside wall there, and it had fell, or they'd shoved it down, whatever. It was between the booth and the wall, where you wouldn't have seen it, you know. And of course, after after what happened, you know, they, I mean, I, I'm sure little Bobby and Barbara knew that that was an act part actually happened that wasn't what it depicted in the movie. Uh, yeah. So they went in there looking for the, they, they went to looking for the person they found it in the, the, in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, thing that gets me is uh, I have seen only the accusation that her purse was stolen never any real proof that it actually no. was. No. Uh, well, go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, we've, I mean, you have talked about it. Uh, the thing that always most amazing thing about it was that the Bogles lived about 20 or 25 miles from where Buford Pusser's brother lived and had a nightclub in Illinois. And I have been told that they were regulars at that club. And I thought that was one heck of a coincidence. Well, especially when you consider here they are vacationing on right. the Gulf Coast. They make it back to McNary County, stay at the motel, and then you find out that uh, they lived in Benson, Illinois, which was not too far from where John Howard Pusser uh, operated a club. So you have to wonder if that was a coincidence or, or exactly what, that they happened to show up that day and, uh, you know, the, the fact that they were uh, allegedly drugged and robbed as they were. Uh, You know, I covered in the last episode all about Louise Hathcock's autopsy. Right. And, you know, one thing I really wanted to kind of reiterate is that uh, Walking Tall showed a very different version of how Louise was shot. You know, Buford walks into a, a crowded bar. Uh, she has a shotgun. She's sitting there at the bar. Uh, she fires a shot. Buford ducks. Uh, buckshot covers the wall. And he raises up from behind the bar and shoots her. When, in fact, uh, he and her were in her uh, room one uh, living quarters after she invited him in there to explain and try to talk her way out of being uh, arrested because, you know, Buford knew that the IRS was about to seize the shamrock for lack of uh, payment on uh, taxes. Uh, Jack, when he died, had not paid 
taxes for a while. And so the IRS was about to seize it. And uh, of course he knew that uh, Louis kept quite a bit of money there. And, you know, speculation is that he was looking for a reason to find it because his paydays at the uh, Shamrock were coming to an end. Right. Is that the way that you see that's things? Pretty well, that's pretty well it. And uh, Polly, we're in room number one. He claimed that he, uh, she pulled a gun on him, fired. He fell across the bed. She fired a second time, except that the uh, gun didn't uh, actually fire. It was a, a misfire. And he pulled out his 41 Magnum. He said his first shot nipped her in the shoulder. Second shot hit the torso. And then his third shot was to her head. And that was while she lay on the floor, uh, which is totally deceiving when you watch Walking Tall and you think you know the real story. And, uh, of course, an autopsy was done on Louise, which uh, showed this to be fact. Uh, yet, when a grand jury was impaneled to uh, look into the cause of her death and, and uh, everything that was behind it, prosecutor didn't show the uh, grand jury the autopsy report. Uh, That's correct. What's your comments there? Well, you know, if you remember, you talked to James Opal Gray, who was sheriff, had sheriff there in McNary County after Pusser, and probably one of the most honest, straightest people that I've, I've ever known. Uh, you know, remember what he told you? Yeah, he, he, was uh, he told me that... Uh... They never saw the autopsy report. That what had he had no idea there was an autopsy report. What the prosecutor showed him were, or, or the uh, grand jury were, close-up photographs of the wounds. And uh, James told me said that he didn't know what he was looking at. Neither did other grand jury members. They just kind of followed the prosecutor's lead, and uh, into thinking that, well, Buford had to shoot her. <laughs> and so they returned a no true bill and uh, basically Buford, uh, you know, walked free on the charge of uh, murder from that. Right. Also, he told me that, uh, you know, they didn't did not hear from uh, Howard Carroll, who heard the shots right. and said that uh, Husser's gun fired first. Yeah, <laughs> kind of an amazing, uh, amazing thing there. Well, you know, I, I've had people to ask me about that, and it apparently it was people that knew absolutely nothing about a gun or anything. How did he know? Well, he was using what a forty-one Magnum. Yes, she was using. Uh, a little old 38. Right. When they go off, there's a big difference. In the sound. In the sound of them. And that's the way that Howard Carroll knew the difference. Right. And, uh, you know, I've had to ask myself many times, and I haven't come up with an answer, uh, about uh, why that Howard, how he could confuse the two. Uh, I don't think he did. I think he knew exactly what he heard and uh, basically knew what had happened. And that may have had a lot to do with why he wasn't called to testify before the grand jury, just to be honest. Right. Uh, at any rate, you know, earlier we mentioned the white iris and there's a lot there that needs to be explained because uh, that was run by Toehead White. And for me, out of all the characters in the movie Walking Tall, uh, and he wasn't even called by his real name there. Uh, right. But of all the characters that were involved in the real story, Toehead White, for me, was the only one that truly earned the reputation that he had. Right. I think uh, he was about as big of a criminal as you could run across in that part of the world. Uh, 
He wasn't afraid to uh, fight. Uh, he'd steal you blind if he had a chance, and he could be polite while he was doing it. Uh, women loved him. Uh, <laughs> a lot of men he probably wanted like to be head. He dressed like a movie star. Well, I've had women tell me that seeing uh, Toehead drive down the street in Corinth was like seeing Elvis Presley drive through. <laughs> right. And uh, that always kind of amazed me. But at any rate, we're going to cover not only what happened at the uh, White Iris in the next episode, but a lot of people aren't aware of the Pecan Farm. And uh, that was, you know, there near Selmer. Toehead White operated both and uh, ran the Razzle game at both locations. So right. we're going to get into that, discuss that in the next episode. And, and uh, uh, we'll just take it from there. Uh, we're about to run out of time on this one. Anything you'd like to add? No, except like I said in the beginning, it was fiction. What you saw in Walking Tall was fiction in the movie. And the books, except yours. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like I tell people, uh, if you want to learn the real story, you have to forget everything you think you know, because everything that we've seen, heard, and read is basically fiction. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like start all over with a clean slate. Uh, look at all these people. Yeah, Jack and Louise committed some crimes, not as bad as what they, uh, the reputation gives them. Uh, Toehead did right. the same, but people don't understand that Buford was a large part of the problem at the state line. That uh, he was mo motivated by greed and, you know, getting payoffs. So, Dennis, like I say, we're running out of time, so I'm going to cut you loose here. And, okay. Uh, uh, we'll see if we can be back in a, another week with another episode. That's fine. That's fine with me. Hey, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you. Thank you for what all you've done. <laughs> you bet.